everybody, it's Professor Michelson here. Uh, welcome to our lecture on psychological theories of crime. Uh, we're now into our third lecture covering theories of criminology. Um, the first was about classical and neoclassical theories, which focus on, you know, choice. Uh, then our second lecture had to do with biological theories of crime, which have nothing to do with choice and everything to do with your physical makeup and how uh, what you were born with affects whether or not you commit crime. Psychological theories of crime have a solid amount of biological um, sort of background to them, and I suppose certainly a level of choice to them. Um, they're the, the most, I don't know, I suppose the most famous, one of the fathers of psychological theories uh, was of course Sigmund Freud. Um, Freud talks a little bit about crime, and you'll see this in your book. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I think it's important to pay attention to uh, Freud simply because he's sort of the father of, of psychology. Um, and the question of the id, the ego, and the superego are, are his concepts, things that we talk about all the time, are things that he came up with. Um, the idea that he came up with for uh, criminal behavior was that um, early childhood, not surprisingly, Freud focused on early childhood experiences, and that um, people's um, early childhood experiences led to frustration and aggression, uh, and therefore uh, they were uh, unable to cope and turn to criminal behavior uh, given those lack of coping skills. Um, and uh, also he focused on the concept of the superego specifically, which meant that um, people wouldn't understand the consequences of their actions. If you have uh, questions about what the id, the ego, and the superego are, make sure you take a look at your book. They're fascinating concepts in the end. Um, August Eichhorn um, also uh, sort of promoted uh, a psychodynamic, which is Freud's perspective, approach to uh, criminal behavior, um, sort of focused a little bit more on it than Freud did. Um, so uh, what's important, what I'd like us to sort of focus on in my lecture, I don't need to go over everything in the book, I'd like to just focus on a few important things in my lecture, uh, are specific mental disorders in crime, first of all. Um, Specifically, I wanted to start with oppositional defiant disorder. Oppositional defiant disorder is a diagnosis that's given only to children, um, and it's kids who are often defying the rules, who are often arguing with adults, getting in trouble in school, they're angry, they're um, spiteful, um, they're generally found to have low self-esteem, and what we've found is that kids, not we, but you know, what, what researchers, psychological researchers into, into crime have found that kids who have oppositional defiant disorder, who've been diagnosed with it according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is sort of the Bible of psychological diagnoses, um, are more likely to be involved in um, juvenile offenses such as bullying or fighting, uh, cruelty towards animals, for example, um, even sexual assault. Um, so uh, identifying kids, and this should bring back to you um, part of the, uh, the discussion that we had in the biological lecture, which looks at this question of if you can find somebody early on who is more likely to be involved in criminal behavior later, what are the implications of that for our criminal justice system? Um, if we knew that a kid who had this diagnosis was more likely, what would you do? Um, and our, our legal system has addressed those issues quite a lot. It's not really an issue for criminologists, um, but those of you who are interested in going into the legal profession, you'll have to give a lot of thought to issues like that. Uh, so oppositional defiant disorder, I think, is important to pay attention to. Schizophrenia is another uh, psychological disorder that um, is often linked with criminal behavior. Um, people who have schizophrenia, often it's, there's a misnomer um, 
it's uh, schizophrenia means split mind. It is not the same as multiple personality disorder. Uh, people who have multiple personality disorder have multiple personalities in one brain. Schizophrenia is not that. Schizophrenia is people, generally it's people that you call crazy. Um, people who are hearing voices, who are hallucinating things that aren't there, um, who have inappropriate behavioral responses, uh, laughing when they shouldn't be laughing, crying when they, not shouldn't, but laughing when nobody else would laugh and crying when nobody else would cry. Um, they might believe themselves to be um, uh, sort of getting messages from the devil or, um, I don't know, following the um, uh, directions of angels, um, getting messages from, from aliens, for example. Um, up on Blackboard, I have some links to a story of a guy named Ralph Tortorici. Um, he was um, uh, he was somebody who suffered from schizophrenia uh, and committed a rather heinous crime. Um, so if you have the chance to take a look at the videos, it's a frontline story, and you could take a look at the videos uh, that were up. Uh, PBS uh, did a story on him, um, and uh, see what you think about his culpability for those crimes, and also think about how different the approach to somebody like Tortorici is from somebody who has a psychological or a biological focus on criminal behavior versus somebody who has a classical or neoclassical uh, perspective on it. Okay. Um, Another example that I'd like to give of where psychological disorders and crime interact is something called postpartum psychosis. Um, postpartum psychosis, as you might guess, is uh, a disorder that happens to women after they have given birth to children. It is very rare. It's different from postpartum depression. Postpartum depression is uh, obviously depression, clinical depression that happens after women have children, often related to a dip in hormones um, and change, a drastic change in their lives. Uh, postpartum psychosis is incredibly, incredibly rare. Uh, but it does happen, and one very famous case uh, was a woman named Andrea Yates, um, who was a seemingly normal woman who had five children. Um, she had some mental health problems over the years, um, though she also had five children over the course of eight years, which anyone who has a kid knows, it seems incredibly stressful. Um, she attempted suicide in 1999 um, and was put on powerful antipsychotic drugs. Um, and hospitalized for severe depression, you know, there was clearly a problem going on in Ms. Yates' life. Um, in 2001, she uh, drowned all five of her children in a bathtub. She uh, believed that uh, she, what she said and what her defense team said when she was tried for these murders uh, was that she... Um, believed that the devil was coming to get them and that she was saving them by killing them. Um, she was diagnosed with postpartum psychosis. She had uh, powerful delusions, um, powerful mood swings, hallucinations, um, and she was found guilty and given a life sentence for killing her children. It was later overturned. The conviction was later overturned, and she remains in a psychiatric facility. Up on Blackboard, I've put up a discussion board um, where I have a, a video. There's a video about her story, interviews with her husband and with her. Or no, no interviews with her, but interviews with her husband uh, and a review of the case. Um, and I'd like you to um, give some thought about whether you believe justice was served. It's very difficult to think about a case like this. So... Be ready. It's a very sad case, um, and uh, you know, five children dead is a horrible thing to think about. As a criminologist, though, you need to examine the facts of the case. Um, well, as an attorney, you examine the facts of the case. As a criminologist, you look at at the circumstances surrounding the crime. Um, not just for Andrea Gates, but as criminologists, we're not looking at individual cases. We're looking at the grander scheme of things and people who have these types of disorders more generally. Um, what do you think about the case? Um, do you think that anything should have been done differently? What can we learn from next time? Um, 
and also like you to pay attention to these different criminological perspectives. How, how might a classical or neoclassical criminologist fall short in a case like this? Um, neoclassical criminologists tried very hard to take into account that there were biological and psychological situations that Joyce couldn't account for. Uh, the strict classical theorists, however, believed that Joyce was everybody. Um, so think about how these different theories uh, work with each other, but then sometimes don't work so well with each other. Um, okay, so the other thing that I wanted to talk about was social learning theory. Um, anybody who's taken a psychology class um, has probably seen uh, a whole lot of <laughs> stuff on B.F. Skinner, who is really the father of um, learning theories in psychology. He talked about, uh, he sort of came up with the idea of conditioning, um, classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Uh, operant conditioning specifically is... Um, uh, focuses on the provision of rewards and punishments. And you'll see uh, also on Blackboard, I think I, let me just check. Yes, I've got it. Um, a video of pigeons uh, that um, Skinner um, basically taught them to read well. It did, he didn't teach them to read. But it looks like he taught them to read by using rewards and punishments. So take a look at the video that's up there on Blackboard. Um, the idea is that Skinner believed that, um, that behavior could be learned and therefore through uh, behavioral modification, this is going to sound a lot like classical and neoclassical theories, through behavior modifications, unacceptable behavior can be changed to, to become acceptable behavior um, using rewards and punishments. Skinner did not care why crime happened. He, well, he didn't focus on crime. He didn't care why behaviors happened. What was going on in people's heads was not something that he was interested in. What he cared about was how to change it and using rewards and punishments to change that. Um, Bandura was another theorist who also looked at that, uh, and he focused on aggression uh, specifically um, as something that was learned by children by observing role models, uh, imitation of role models, and then acting out um, the roles of those people. So really social learning theory, as per the name, is about learning. Um, let's see what else I wanted to talk about. Ah. Therefore, I'm going to bring up one of people's favorite topics in criminology, the role of the media and crime. If criminal behavior, as per Bandura and Skinner, is learned by observation, what happens then when people observe movies, music, television, where uh, aggressive behavior, criminal behavior, is happening. Actually, yesterday, I, I, um, I spent a lot of time on the couch uh, yesterday doing some work, and I had on uh, criminal, what is it, law and order, uh, SVU on, like, all day. It was one of those marathons. I watched a lot of criminal behavior <laughs> happening all day long. If criminal behavior is learned, why am I not going out and doing some pretty terrible things to people in the park? What we know um, is that there is a whole lot of violence in the media, um, and what we have learned uh, through many studies is that TV violence, media violence, is associated with aggression, um, aggressive behavior. What we seem to have narrowed it down to, however, is uh, aggression in children. The uh, American Psychological Association put out a report called the it's the APA Task Force on Television and Society. Um, the conclusions of those report of that report uh, were that there are direct effects of uh, media violence on people, uh, specifically um, children. Um, sort of most most likely to be children that there is um, they may develop aggressive behaviors because they watch aggressive behavior. Second of all, desensitization to violent behavior that uh, people who see a lot of violence in the media may be less sensitive to violence in the real world after all, and sort of other people's pain and suffering. 
And then lastly, uh, there's something called the mean world uh, syndrome, which suggests that people who watch a lot of violence in the media may start to believe that the world is a terrible place, it's a mean place, a dangerous place, um, and uh, that uh, they need to react accordingly, um, but that it's they view it not because of anything real, but because of something that they see in the media. Um, so, but really in the end, uh, they focus on uh, the effects on children. Now, um, there's a, a movie uh, that's in the Montclair Library. If anyone is interested in doing an extra credit, uh, assignment. It's probably also available on Netflix. I'd be very surprised if it weren't. Um, and maybe at your local video store. I doubt that, but maybe. Um, Amazon might have it screen, uh, streaming. Um, called Dream Worlds 3. Um, and I put up a discussion board on Blackboard where you can discuss what you think about the effects of media on violence, on criminal behavior. Um, and um, I'll put a link up to the American Psychological Association report. Um, so let's get that discussion going on Blackboard, uh, those three discussions going on Blackboard that I've discussed. And if you're interested in doing the extra credit report, um, send me an email. Um, and you can watch the Dream Worlds 3 film, and what you'll do is you'll write up a thousand word paper uh, that gives me a brief description of the film. Um, and then talks about how it relates back to the theories that we've been learning in class and everything else that we've been learning uh, in the book and in the lectures and in the readings, okay? So, get your reading done, get on the discussion boards, um, and make sure you're doing the quizzes when they're due, all right? Take care, everybody.